presence of everyone here this evening. I encourage you to take out your Bibles and be turning to the 30, 23rd chapter of the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 23, the passage that Mike read for us a moment ago. So that will be our starting point here in just a minute. But the background before we get to Numbers 23, really chapters 22, 23, and 24, is a story familiar to us, mostly the contents of 22. And that is, it is the story of Balaam and Balak. And so as you go back into chapter 22 and you see the events of, of Numbers chapter 22, it's where Balak is sent out for Balaam uh, because he's heard that whoever he blesses is blessed, but whoever he curses is cursed. And so he sends for, uh, Balak sends for Balaam to come to him because he sees the people of Israel. He sees how uh, how numerous they are, and he would like Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. And so he calls there for Balaam. Balaam, of course, says, I have to inquire first of the Lord. He inquires and is told no. And then he sends the men away, and then they come back again and offer him more, and he inquires again because Balaam wants to go. And, of course, he does ultimately go. And it is there that we're familiar with the story, particularly kids are familiar with the story, where uh, the, his donkey saves him from going and being struck down by an angel, but then he strikes the donkey three times on three separate occasions, and finally the donkey turns to him and asks why he struck him. And so we're familiar with that part of the story in particular. But the story doesn't end in chapter 22 when he comes to, to Balak. At the end of 22 and through 23 and 24 are a number of, uh, of prophecies that are made by Balaam concerning the children of Israel. And so uh, starting at verse 41 of chapter 22 and going into chapter, uh, chapter 24. And of course, that doesn't end the story of Balaam. You go into chapter 25, and though we don't realize it at the time, he's the one that recommends that the women be sent out to the Israelites, where we have the sin of Baal of Peor in Numbers chapter 25, where Israel was guilty of, uh, of fornication. And so, uh, really, those four chapters have to do with him, but he's mentioned mostly in those three. It is in the midst of the first prophecy, or rather near the end of the first prophecy, before Balak says in verse 11, that was read for us a moment ago, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you've blessed them bountifully. Well, the end of that blessing is verse 10. And in verse 10, this is what it reads. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number one-fourth of Israel? That is, look how numerous the people are. I mean, who can count them? It's just counting the dust just as Abraham was told his descendants would be. Who could number even a fourth of Israel? The, the, the nation is so large in number. But we want to focus on a statement made at the end of verse 10, and that is where he says, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. There's something about the death of the righteous that Balaam says in his prophecy here in Numbers chapter 23, let me die their death. Let my end be like that of the righteous. So for a few moments this evening, let's consider that phrase, let me die the death of the righteous. But before we get into the death of the righteous itself, let's begin by understanding this part. Death is a part of life. There's a popular saying. You've heard it numerous times before. There are two things certain in life. Death and taxes. Now, there's more certain in life, and that is if there's those that have reached the age of accountability, it is certain that they will become guilty of sin. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 9 through verse 23 would point that out to us. But really, while this statement is mostly actually focused on the taxes side of it, and that is, oh, it's time to pay taxes. You know, there's two things certain in life, death and taxes. The first, half, the first half of that's true as well. Death is a certainty of life. In fact, the Bible tells us that same thing over and over again. Go to the book of Joshua chapter 23 with me. 
Joshua chapter 23. Death is called the way of all the earth. In Joshua 23 and in verse 14, as Joshua was giving his farewell address to the people, he said, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. As the footnote of the New King James would say, I'm going to die. That's the point he's making. But he uses the phrase, the way of all the earth, because death is certain. In fact, as you go throughout history, you and you go throughout biblical history and history since, men, many men have lived, and they've all died, with the exception of, of two men. We read one in Genesis chapter 5. Uh, Enoch was not for God took him, and then Elijah. But death is a part of life that men die. And when you go to Genesis chapter 5, it is an impressive list there in terms of the length of years that people lived. In Genesis chapter 5, you read about people living 700, 800, 900 years. When you get to a man that lived 700 years, it feels like he died at such a young age compared to those that were living well into their 900s. But do you know what happened with all of those with the exception of Enoch? It says, and he died. In 1 Kings chapter 2 and in verse 2, David, in giving his farewell address to his son Solomon, said, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Death is called the way of all the earth. In fact, the Hebrew writer would point out that it's appointed a man once to die, Hebrews 9.27. And as it is pointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. The point of Hebrews chapter 9 is not about our death. The point of Hebrews chapter 9 is about the sacrifice of Christ being the ultimate sacrifice. That's what Hebrews chapter 9 on into the first part of chapter 10 is dealing with. But in Hebrews chapter 9, in order to prove the point that the sacrifice of Christ is a sufficient sacrifice, that is, it's not like the blood of bulls and goats. That as you get into chapter 9 and on into chapter 10, it's pointed out, that, you know, they, the same sacrifices were offered repeatedly year after year. The point is being made that Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. And the argument used in Hebrews 9.27 is this. Just as it is, as it is appointed for men to die once. That is, we all die and we all die once. I think obviously there were exceptions in the scripture where somebody was raised from the dead and then would die again later on. But it is appointed to man to die once. Now, sometimes you hear people talk about somebody being uh, clinically dead. And so, you know, they brought them back to life. And all they mean is there was a, a moment where their heart stopped or they stopped breathing. And so they were clinically dead. But they weren't really dead because nobody was resurrected. There was no miracle that took place. And it was just medical intervention. And so when you think about it, though, there's no, at the end, when somebody truly dies, that's it. That's the end of life. And so as we die once, Christ died once to bear the sins of many. And so the whole argument in Hebrews 9 to prove the sacrifice of Christ is that he died once, just as we died once, which tells us we all are going to die. Unless Christ returns first, we shall all see death. So as we get ready to talk about the death of the righteous, we've got to begin by understanding that death is a part of life. But now let's talk about the death of the righteous itself. What's this idea of the death of the righteous? Well, as we talk about it, we want to first look at some similarities between the death of the righteous and unrighteous. There are some things that are similar or the same about the death of the righteous and the unrighteous. But then there are some things that are drastically different, which is what leads to Balaam making the statement, let me die the death of the righteous. But let's begin my understanding in terms of similarity. As we already saw the certainty of death, that's something that applies to both righteous and unrighteous alike. We already looked at Joshua 23, 14, but consider Ecclesiastes 9, 1 to 3. In Ecclesiastes, as Solomon is in his search for what truly makes for happiness in life, Here's what he said. For I considered all that is in my heart so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. 
things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the clean, or to the good, the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who does not sacrifice. As he is good, as is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath is he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, madness in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. The point that, that Solomon is making in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and 1 to 3 is that as I looked out, I realized, regardless of one standing with God, there is one event that happens to everybody, and that is death. And that is the righteous and the unrighteous, the clean and the unclean. All of the, the ones that sacrifice and the ones that don't, all of these ultimately come to the end. They go to the dead. And so the certainty of death that we talked about a minute ago is a similarity between the death of the righteous and unrighteous. Not only is the certainty of death a similarity, the uncertainty of its timing is a similarity. In Proverbs 27 and in verse 1, the wise man wrote, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. In James 4, 13 to 16, James wrote by inspiration and said, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Death is certain, its timing is not. We may, we, our life may be required of us tonight, it may be tomorrow, it may be a week from now, it may be 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now. We just don't know. Death is certain. That's the similarity between the righteous and unrighteous. Its timing is uncertain. That's true for both the righteous and unrighteous. What happens physically, that is the separation of the spirit and the body, that happens to both the righteous and the unrighteous. In Ecclesiastes 12 and in verse 7, it says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. In James chapter 2 and in verse 26, in talking about faith and works, he said, you know, talking about some that say, You show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. He makes the point illustrating what kind of faith you have if it is without works. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That is, there, when somebody dies, at the end of somebody's life, you can't look at what happens to them physically and go, you know what, that was a righteous person or that was an unrighteous person. Just by looking at the physical aspect of death, it's the same. It's the separation of the spirit and the body. Whether one's righteous or unrighteous, that is exactly the same. And let me say this, there's another similarity, and that is, it is not the end of either. Death is not the end of the righteous, nor is death the end of the unrighteous. Go to Luke 16 with me. It's a story very well familiar to us. It's a story, I don't think it's a parable. We talked about this when we studied the book of Luke. Uh, if it is a parable, it's the only one in which Jesus used the name. And he talks about two men, a rich man and a man named Lazarus. And it said, beginning at verse 19, that there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple, fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And you can read the rest of the story later on. But the point we're trying to see is both of them died. One was righteous, one was not. One was in torment, one was in Abraham's bosom or paradise, awaiting the final judgment. They were both in the Hadean realm awaiting final judgment. And then ultimately, we're going to stand before Christ in judgment, and those that have, that have done evil will receive condemnation, and those who have done what is right will receive the resurrection unto life. But the point that we need to understand is, death is not the end. If death was the end, then why are we here tonight? 
When you think about that, if death is the end, then why, why, why do we come together? Why do we spend time in prayer? Why do we spend time in study? If death is the end, then all there is is this life. And as Paul would point out, then let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If there is nothing after this life, but there is, there's resurrection, either to life or to condemnation. And so the point we need to understand is, is that death is not the end, whether righteous or unrighteous. Death is not the end for either one. So you see, there are similarities between the death of the righteous and unrighteous. It's certainty. It's uncertainty of timing. What happens physically and the fact that it's not the end of either. But now let's talk about the differences. What are the differences in the death of the righteous and the unrighteous? Well, let's begin by understanding God's view of it is different. Go to Psalm 116. God's view of the death of the righteous is that it is something that is precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116. And in verse 15. And we'll talk in a minute from our aspect as to why we should view death differently if we're righteous versus unrighteous and the differences that are pointed out. But as you look at what's said here and you consider what we'll see in a moment about the difference in the death between the righteous and unrighteous, God considers that death precious because it's the rest from labors. It's, it means that the righteous will have their reward. See, the death of the righteous is something that God says is precious in his sight. But on the other side of that, in Ecclesiastes 33, 11, it would, the Lord would say this, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? See, in Psalm 116 and in verse 15, it says that the Lord finds the death of the righteous to be precious, but in Ezekiel 33 and in verse 11, it says that he has no delight in the death of the wicked because they're going to perish. They need to turn and live. So you see, when we talk about the differences between the death of the righteous and the death of the unrighteous, God's view of their death is different. He says precious is the death of the righteous, but he has no delight in the death of the wicked. But not only is God's view of it uh, a reason that we should, or, or a difference between it, our viewpoint of the two should be different. And that is when you consider the death of the righteous and what the scriptures say, the death of the righteous is to be considered a gain, not a loss. In Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 25, or 21 rather, the apostle Paul, in talking about possibly being near the end of his life, he would point out later in this epistle, that perhaps he was being poured out as a drink offering. Now, we know that he was not put to death after that imprisonment. He was released. That's when 1 Timothy that we studied not long ago was written. And then he's in prison a second time when 2 Timothy is written, when he is being poured out as a drink offering. But at this time, Paul has some uncertainty around his death, as do us all. And what he said is he, he was sort of torn between whether to stay or to depart. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Now, the reason death is gain is because of the first part. He lives for Christ. But you see, the death of the righteous is gain. When we think about death, we think about the loss of life. That's what we, have, we refer to it sometimes. It's somebody lost their life. That's how we refer to death. And obviously, there's a loss in death. But, there is a, but when one is righteous and they pass from this life, it's also a gain. Physically, we may feel a loss. That is, that relationship that we once had is no longer there. But death is a gain for those that are righteous when they pass from this life. They have rest from their troubles. They no longer have to live in a world full of sin and wickedness. To them, it is gain. In fact, Paul would say later on in that same chapter, in verse 23, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And you've heard me say this before. My understanding is there is, no, there is no wording in the English strong enough to show how much better it is to go and be with Christ from verse 23. Most literally translated, it would be grammatically incorrect in the English. 
And that is, the best way to convey just how much better it is would be to translate it this way. For that is very much far better. We don't speak like that in our language, but I think it shows us just the kind of how much better and how much of a gain it is, the loss of, or for those who, are, who lose their life but are servants of God. But not only is it a gain, it's something to have comfort in, not something to be feared. If you look up a list of the top fears of people, you'll find a number of things. Fear of heights will be up there. Maybe fear of things like spiders or snakes or some kind of uh, creature is up there. But one of the things near the top of most people's fear list is a fear of death. And if you're not righteous, death is something that should be feared. Because it's the end of an opportunity to come to Christ, as Luke 16 would point out, where the rich man can no longer change. But for those who are faithful servants of God, death is not something to be feared. It is something to find comfort in. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the question is being raised by those at Thessalonica. What has happened to those who've passed on? Those who are servants of God that are no longer with us. And time has passed. Uh, several years have passed since Christ has ascended into heaven. Some who were serving Him faithfully have passed from this life. What's going to be of them? Are they at any disadvantage? Paul is pointing out throughout this chapter how they'll be raised from the dead. And what he said in verse 16 is, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. In verse 18, therefore, comfort one another with these words. It's not just comfort for those that are alive when Christ returns. It's comfort for those, know, for those knowing that if they die or for those they've loved that have passed on, that they have the same hope. And that is, they may not, be, they're not having to stand there going, what happened to to, to my, my parents or grandparents or siblings or cousins or whoever's passed from this life, are they at any disadvantage? And the answer is no. They will be called up to meet Christ in the air just as we will. They'll be raised from the dead. Use these or comfort one another with these words. You tell this to one another to provide comfort. There's comfort in the death of the righteous. Acts chapter 12, I think, would prove that point. In Acts chapter 12, here James... The brother of John has been killed with the sword by Herod. Peter is taken and put into prison. They're waiting for the Passover to end before Peter is to be put to death. Peter is being kept in prison while prayer is being offered for him, constant prayer is being offered to him by the church, according to verse 5. But now it comes to the day before Peter is to be put to death. The next day is set to be the uh, the day that Peter is killed because of his service to God. And here's what it says in verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in prison, and he struck Peter on the side raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Peter's supposed to be put to death. You know where we find Peter? We find Peter sleeping, chained between two guards. I think I've used this illustration before. If you have some task you're supposed to undertake the next day, I don't care what it is, but particularly if it's something that perhaps could cause some kind of worry, some kind of anxiety about it, if you're scheduled for a surgery early in the morning, you may have a hard time sleeping the night before. If you're scheduled for a test early in the morning, you may have a hard time sleeping the night before. Not even with anything like that. If you just know you have to get up and undertake something, maybe you've got to go on a trip early in the morning, you may have a hard time sleeping the night before. Peter is supposed to be put to death. 
He's not sleeping in a comfortable bed on a pillow where it's nice and cozy. He's chained between two guards, and yet he can sleep. Because if Peter's life's taken from him, he's gained his reward. There's comfort in death. He could find the comfort in the possibility of his death. We can find comfort in our death and comfort in the death of loved ones who've gone on, who serve God faithfully. What's different about the death of the righteous and the unrighteous? Well, God's view of it's different. Our view of it should be different. It's a gain. It's not a loss. There's comfort in it, not something to be feared. Thirdly, we have a hope and an expectation of the resurrection and the life. The unrighteous, the resurrection unto condemnation. In John chapter 5 and in verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. As I said earlier, if this life is all there is, then there would be no need for us to spend all our time to spend all our time studying and to spend time in worship and to spend time in prayer because when this life is over, that's all there is. But we know that's not the case. There's a resurrection. And all who are in the grave will be resurrected. It's a matter of what resurrection will it be. And for those who are righteous, they have the resurrection unto life. The resurrection to be with God forever. Gathered around the throne singing praises to Him. There's a song Amazing Grace says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. But on the other side of that, those who have done evil have the resurrection of condemnation. Some translations say the resurrection of the judgment. And that is, they will be raised from the dead, but they will suffer eternal condemnation in hell. There's no comfort in that. That's not a gain. That's a law. You see, we have the hope, but not just the hope, the expectation. And I think sometimes we forget that aspect of hope. Now, the word hope, sometimes we use the word hope and we're talking about desiring something. I hope that. And it's really we're using it as desire. The word hope really has desire, is desire plus expectation. We have the hope and the desire. We have the expectation because God has promised us the resurrection and the life if we will serve him faithfully. So our viewpoint of death should be different. God's viewpoint of the death of the righteous and unrighteous is different. Our viewpoint of the death between the righteous and unrighteous should be different. And then let's understand this. Here's the big, here's a big difference. The death of the righteous, it is a blessing. In Revelation 14 and in verse 13, it says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may have rest from their labors and their works Father, Because of the rest from labors. In fact, we talked about that in our invitation on Wednesday evening in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that there were those who would have trouble would have rest. There were those who would cause the trouble in this life that would suffer tribulation and punishment from God. And that is, if we're the faithful servant of God, we have rest. Rest from all the toils, troubles, and labors of life. And because of that, death is a blessing for those who die in the Lord. Balaam said, let me die the death of the righteous, let my end be like his. We have to understand first and foremost, as we talk about dying the death of the righteous, we've got to start by understanding that death is just a part of life. It's something that is certain. We then need to understand the death of the righteous, and, uh, and so that involves us involve understanding first and foremost some similarities between the righteous and unrighteous death in that they're both certain. The timing of when they will happen is uncertain. What happens from a physical standpoint is the same. And it is not the end of either, because both will stand before God in judgment. There are some differences, though. God's view of it is different. He views the death of the righteous as, pre as precious. The death of the uh, wicked, he has no delight in. Our viewpoint should be different, because the death of the righteous is a gain, not a loss. There's comfort in it. It's not something to be feared. We have the hope and expectation of the resurrection and the life, while the wicked have the, resurrection, the, the expectation of the resurrection and the condemnation. 
and the death of the righteous is a blessing. As we close this evening, let's consider one more thing in the lesson of years. Let's consider for a few moments how to have the death of the righteous. Balaam said, let me die the death of the righteous. As we've looked at all of these different similarities and differences between them, hopefully our attitude is that of Balaam uh, and what he says in, in Numbers 23.10, let me die the death of the righteous. When I die, I want it to be the death of the righteous. How do we have that? Well, first and foremost, we walk in God's commandments. In Luke chapter 1, we're introduced to a man by the name of Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, parents of John. And what it says of them in verse 6 is, and they walked, or they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Why is it that Zacharias and Elizabeth could be described as righteous individuals? Well, they could be described as righteous because they walked in all the commandments of God. And so you say, I want to die the death of the righteous. I want my end to be like that of the righteous. I want to have that comfort. I want to have that gain in death. I want it to be a blessing. Then that it requires us to walk in God's commandments, not just God's commandments, in all of God's commandments. After all, if we fail in one matter, we are guilty of the whole law, according to James chapter 2. And so we need to walk in God's commandments. You say, I want to die the death of the righteous. How do I have that? You need to walk in God's commandments. Secondly, you need to walk in righteousness. You want to be righteous, you walk in righteousness. In 1 John 2 and in verse 29, it says, If you uh, know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. In chapter 3 and in verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. This is he is righteous. You say, I, I want to have the death of the righteous. Well, in order to, to do that, you've got to be righteous, which means you walk in righteousness. You do that which is right. You follow God's law. You follow God's plan. It's not about what we want. It's about what God says. In fact, in, in Romans chapter 1 and 16 and 17, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Better translated is not just. It is the righteous shall live by faith. And so the righteousness of God is revealed in the law. And as you go throughout the book of Romans and how it's used and how we need to submit to it, Romans chapter 10. How it's revealed apart from the law, Romans 1 and Romans 3. How is something we don't need to be ignorant of? What you see is God's righteousness as described in Romans is God's plan to make man righteous. It's that which is revealed in the gospel, according to Romans 1. And so we walk in righteousness. That is, we walk in the commandments of God. We walk in righteousness. We do what he says is right. Not only that, in order to be righteous, we don't just do what's right. We avoid that which is sinful. We abstain from sin. In 1 John 5 and in verse 17, it says, All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. In chapter 3 of the same, chapter, uh, the same book, he said in verse 3, beginning, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. We abstain from sin. You see, I want to be found right in the eyes of God. I want to be somebody that's righteous. Being righteous involves doing God's commandments. It involves walking in righteousness. That is, keeping in, in God's, plan, God's plan for making us righteous. Not man's righteousness, not man's ideas, God's plan for making man righteous. It means we abstain from sin, and finally, it means we have an active faith. James 2, beginning at verse 20. 
It says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith, or do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Listen to verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. We have an active faith. We don't just have faith. We live in a society that has faith in the sense of they believe in God. According to verse 19, even the demons believe and tremble. It's not just a faith that we say, oh, I believe in God, and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe that Jesus came to this earth, that he lived, that he died, that he was raised from the dead. That's all part of of faith. But it's not just that we believe. We have an active and an obedient faith. That's what's accounted as righteousness. That's what was accounted to Abraham as righteousness. He believed God. But he didn't just believe him. He acted on that faith. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so how do I have the death of the righteous? I, like Balaam said, let me die the death of the righteous. We have seen what kind of death that is. We know death is certain, regardless of whether we're righteous or unrighteous. We know that we don't that, that, that its timing is uncertain for both righteous and unrighteous. We know the physical aspect of death, that is the separation of the spirit and body, is the same for righteous and unrighteous. We know that it's not the end of either one of us. Of, the, of us, the righteous or unrighteous. But there's some major differences. God's view, that he views the death of the righteous as precious instead of having no delight in it. Our viewpoint, it's a gain, not a loss. There's comfort in it, not something to be feared. We have that hope of, of the resurrection and the life instead of the hope of, uh, or instead of facing the resurrection and the condemnation. It is a blessing. And so I want to make sure that when I die, I die the death of the righteous. That means I walk in God's commandments. I walk in righteousness. I abstain from sin. I have an active faith. Let me ask you this question as we come to a close. If your life was required of you tonight, would you die the death of the righteous? If you knew for certain that your life was required of you tonight would you die the death of the righteous as you look at yourself can you say that i'm in a right relationship with god i walk in his commandments i walk in righteousness i'm abstaining from sin i have an active faith if so and your life was required of you tonight you would die the death of the righteous but if you look at yourself and you realize you know what if i my life was required of me tonight i would die the death the unrighteous. And what you need to do is have the attitude of Balaam. Let me die the death of the righteous. And realize that while I cannot guarantee you that your life is required of you tonight, I can guarantee you this. It will come at a time at which you do not expect. Life is but a vapor, as James pointed out and we saw earlier. It appears for a short time and then vanishes away. Your life might be required of you tonight. Even if your life is not required of you tonight, Christ could return and we could stand before him in judgment. And your fate would be the same whether you die tonight or Christ return tonight. So what you need to do this evening is make your life right with God. If you're here and you've not yet obeyed the gospel, but you've heard the word of God, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, you not repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, be buried in the waters of baptism, rising to walk in the newness of life, having your sins forgiven having the hope of heaven when life on earth is over, having that hope of the resurrection and the life, and knowing that if your life was required of you tonight, you could die the death of the righteous. Maybe you're here and you've done that, but you say, somewhere along the line, I've not been as righteous as I need to be, that I've gone outside the, the doctrine of Christ, that I've not kept his commandments as I needed to. If it's a sin of a private nature, you can take it to the Lord tonight privately in prayer, and he'll forgive you if you're sincere of it. But if it's a sin of a public nature, you would desire the prayers of the congregation. We will gladly pray with you and for you this evening for God to forgive you. No matter what your need is, if we could assist you tonight in any way, which you're not going for right now, it's together we stand. Now as we sing.